Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone welcome to the course on medical biomaterials we will continue on these uh, metallic uh, biomaterials. Let us uh, recap what we did on this. First, we looked at uh, what is uh, Miller index of a plane. That means, uh, a plane has an unique uh, identity which is represented by this uh, Miller index. Then, um, what is this lattice unit cell? That means, each crystal is made up of uh, certain repeating units, infinite repeating units and that is called a unit cell. There are seven classes of these unit cells okay, and then there are there are 14 Brevis types. Okay. So, we looked at uh, the 7 classes of uh, unit cells based on the, the 3 sides A, B, C and uh, based on the 3 angles alpha, beta, gamma. Then we looked at the symmetry, there are different types of symmetry that is the, uh, the, the translational symmetry, the rotational symmetry, mirror symmetry and so on. Uh, why do we have to do all this? Because uh, there is an isotropy of the crystals that means the direction in which for example the uh, load is acting the number of uh, atoms in that crystal will be part of it so that will affect the mechanical properties so uh, for example if it's a bcc and uh, the direction of the force is across the longer diagonal uh, the uh, bcc the atom that's inside the uh, um, the body also will be part of it. So, the um, mechanical strength will be higher, the Young's modulus will be higher. Whereas, if the load is along one of the planes, uh, that particular um, atom which is inside uh, the BCC will not be taking place. So, the number of atoms come down. So, the Young's modulus also decreases. So, and so on actually. So, the mechanical properties um, are determined uh, in the direction in which the force acts. Uh, for a BCC or for a FCC or a HCP. Then we looked at something called a coordination number that means total number of neighbors that each atom will have. So, what is the coordination number for BCC, what is the coordination number for FCC, what is the coordination number for HCP and so on. And then defects because uh, when the crystal starts growing, uh, it is not going to be completely perfect. There are going to be point defects, uh, there could be line defects, there could be bulk defects. Uh, there could be impurities coming into it and so on. So, we looked at defects because defects again is going to affect the physical chemical properties of that particular crystal or the metal. Okay. Then we looked at grain boundary as the crystal grows from different directions, they come and collide inside and there are grains formed and the grain boundaries determine uh, the slip, uh, their defects, their physical chemical properties and so on actually. Okay. So, grain boundaries are very, very important and later on we are going to look at sometimes corrosion starts taking place along the grain boundary also. So, grain boundary plays a very important role in the properties of the metal. And then uh, we looked at atoms of different sizes when they are part of the crystal. For example, sodium chloride, sodium and chlorine, um, how do they form a crystal? Or if I am going to add an impurity atom um, to the existing uh, crystal. For example, in uh, uh, stainless steel, we are having uh, carbon, we are having nickel okay, with iron. So, how are they going to fit into it? Are they of different radius or are they of same radius? And uh, so, what are the different sizes um, of uh, atoms that could just fit into the gap left behind uh, by other atom? Okay. So, all these we looked at in the past uh, three or four lectures and uh, today also we will look at uh, some more properties of metals. Okay. So, the crystal structure like I said chromium is a body centered cubic, cobalt is a uh, hexagonal closed packing. Iron interestingly uh, the packing crystal structure changes at different temperatures at 900 less than 912 it is BCC, um, it is FCC between 912 and 1394, it is again BCC around greater than 1394. So, if you look at molybdenum for example, it is a BCC, nickel it is a FCC, titanium at two different uh, the temperature less than 900 it is HCP 
above 900 it's BCC. Sodium chloride is FCC, aluminum oxide it's CP. Polyethylene is polymer, generally polymers uh, will be amorphous, it will not be really crystalline uh, majority, but again there are many polymers which are crystalline or they could have a mixture of uh, crystalline and uh, um, amorphous, PE polyethylene is orthorhombic. Okay? There is something called atomic packing factor, it is also called packing efficiency or packing fraction, uh, packing fraction that means fraction of the volume in a crystal that is occupied by the uh, atoms. That means the opposite of the 1 minus that fraction will give you what is a void space. Okay? The void space if it is minimum then it will be a very strong crystal, if the void space is maximum it is like a porous, so the strength is much much lower. So, the hexagonal closed packed if you take HCP the atomic packing fraction is 0 0.74, if you take face centered cubic packing fraction is 0.74, if you take body centered cubic it is 0.68, simple cubic and uh, that means only the corner 8 are filled with atoms it will be 0 0.52, diamond cubic 0 0.34. So, as you can see uh, it keeps going down and HCP has the highest packing factor 0 0.74, then comes FCC, then comes BCC and so on actually. Um, how do you calculate? Okay, Let us take uh, a yeah, BCC for example, uh, we have been seeing BCC, there is one big uh, atom in the center that is why it is called body centered and then we have 8 atoms at 8 corners. Okay, so, if you take the long diagonal, uh, we have the big atom 2R of uh, radius R, 2R is the length and then another atom at the corner, both the corners, so this length is 4R. Uh, for a cube, the long diagonal is given by square root of 3 side, so if you take A as the side, square root of 3A should be equal to 4R, we looked at that long time back right? for some other purpose also. Okay. Now, um, how many atoms are there? Number of atoms is one big atom that is uh, part of this cube and there are 8 uh, corners, there are atoms, but these corner atoms are show, shared by 8 different cubes. So, that will be 1 eighth of multiplied by 8, that will be 1. Okay. So, the number of atoms uh, will be 1 plus 1, 2. Okay. Number of atoms is 2. Uh, vo volume of one spherical atom, okay. 4 by 3 pi r cube. 4 by 3, 3.14 into r cube. Now, A I said is equal to um, 4 r by square root of 3, right. So, what is packing factor? Number of atoms, volume of one atom divided by the volume of this cube, cube is A cube. Okay. So, um, A is given here, so you can put it here that will become cube, okay. volume of one spherical atom is this multiplied by 2. So, when you do all these, we get 3.141 into square root of 3 by 8, 0.68, right. So, BCC is, BCC is 0.68, that is how you get it. So, it is a lot of geometry involved in the, this type of calculation. Packing factor is very important for you to know um, how well packed the um, crystal is or what is the void space in the crystal. Okay. Uh, fatigue is another important property which comes in. Uh, of course, even in non-metals, uh, the maximum stress that a metal will withstand without failure for a specified number of cycles. For example, if you have um, heart valves, it keeps on um, um, moving, opening, moving, opening, so that is how many times we can do that. It is more important than tensile or edel strength because uh, heart valves, knee joints, um, all these undergo a lot of fatigue. Okay? So, that is more important rather than the strength. Okay, um, grain size reduction. Like I said, uh, uh, grain boundaries are formed because as the crystal grows from different directions, um, they collide and then there is a grain uh, boundaries that are formed. So, ideally, smaller the grain size, stronger will be the particular crystal. Um, finer and more homogeneous grain size leads to more homogeneous packing of the crystal and it stops dislocation type movement. That means, it will prevent the slip um, of each crystal. So, it improves the toughness. So, ideally in metals they like to try to reduce grain size. This can be controlled by slowing the rate of solidification. Okay? That means, uh, when it is cooling, do it very, very slowly, do not do it very fast, then you will have lots of big, big crystallites and there will be a lot of grains. Uh, plastic deformation after solidification. 
That is, you have heard of in the stress strain graph, we have uh, the elastic initial and then later on we have the plastic, right. Uh, so, uh, once it has cooled down, we can try to deform it in the plastic. So, all these will help in the grain size reduction, okay. Uh, there is something called strain hardening, okay. So, ductile metals become stronger when they are deformed plastically at temperatures well below the melting point. So, that is called cold working, okay. So, you bring it down below their melting point and then they deform it plastically so that it gets very hard, okay. The dislocation density increases with plastic deformation. So, the average distance between dislocation decreases and the dislocation starts blocking the motion of each one. So, they are not going to get dislocated further, okay. Okay, then um, there is something called the metal leaching, metal attrition that is metal on metal joints. There are joints, there are metal and they start moving one on top of the other or one related to other. If there is going to be attrition, there could be metal leaching, okay, or sometimes debris leaching. This is a big problem in orthopedic biomaterials, um, knee joints, okay, especially there. Because in orthopedic they use metals, titanium alloys, which mainly used for plates, screws, prosthetic, cobalt, chromium, molybdenum alloys for prosthetic, stainless steel for plates, screws, wire, polymers, polymethylmethacrylate as a cementing agent, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene as the prosthetic insert, ceramics, aluminum oxide for prosthetic surfacing, zirconium prosthetic surfacing. So, you could have metal leaching uh, or metal debris, even polymer debris are also possible, but more than poly polymer debris metal debris, metal leaching causes more problems actually. Um, so because elevated chromium cobalt in blood and urine are observed in some cases, they can even form non-scale non, non -A and large in number unlike polymer. Other ions that are also released are titanium, aluminum, vanadium and nickel, but uh, cobalt is the main chap, okay. That is a uh, big problem, chromium. Cobalt toxicity can affect many or or organs neurological problem, cardiological problem, hematolo hematological problem and endocrine problem. Chromium is less cytotoxic than cobalt, but it also induces interstitial cell damage, tubulin necrosis, which can affect your uh, renal, that means your kidneys. So, uh, especially knee joints, who are people who had artificial uh, metal knees always find uh, leaching of these metal in the blood. Uh, Let us look at a simple problem uh, this problem was taken from this reference. Uh, calculate the number of cobalt ions released from this cobalt chromium molybdenum, okay. This contains 65 percent cobalt, okay, of uh, the head is 28 mm dia of a hip joint. The wear rate is 0.14 millimeter per year, okay. So, density of cobalt is 8.83. They want to find how many cobalt ions are released, okay. Uh, so, um, when it is released from uh, the prosthesis, only 65 percent contains cobalt, okay. Rest all is chromium and molybdenum, okay. So, let us look at the area uh, because we said the head 28 mm, okay, 4 pi 1.4 square, okay. Now, um, when you have hip joint, it is like a ball and socket, so only half of it is in contact with the socket. The ball, half of the ball only is contact, remaining half is outside, so we will take only one half, okay. So, we will divide this by one half, okay. Um, so, this is the area, the volume is one half of 24.63 into 0 0.014 centimeter per year, okay, because this is the wear rate. This is in millimeter, so I divided, I mean by 10. So, so many. Uh, cc of uh, cobalt, okay, so many cc of the uh, alloy comes out, okay. Out of this only 65 percent is cobalt, so many cc of the alloy per year is coming out, okay. So, what do we do? Um, we multiply by 0 0.65 because it is 65 percent cobalt, okay. Density of cobalt is 8.83 and then uh, you know this is the Avogadro number 6.023. Um, 10 power 23 divided by atomic weight is 58.93 here, okay, and because we are converting that into mole. So, that gives you 1 into 10 power 22 atoms of cobalt per year, understand. So, 
Um, volume of the prosthetic is this much, 65 percent is cobalt, so we multiply by 0.65. Okay, now, we are converting it into number of atoms. So, how do we convert it? Okay, so, how do we convert that? Uh, we divide by 58.93, multiply by Avogadro number and also multiply by the density of uh, cobalt. Okay. So, 0 0.65 into 1 multiplied by 0 0.7, 0 0.172 is the cc of cobalt. When we multiply by density of cobalt, that will give you gram of cobalt, that is 8.83. When we divide by 58.3, that uh, molecular atomic weight of cobalt, that will give you a mole of cobalt. When we multiply by the Avogadro number, well, that will give you the atoms of cobalt. So, 10 power 22 atoms of cobalt are leaching out um, when there is a wear of 0.14 of the hip joint. But of course, uh, we are not going to have continuously cobalt uh, purely dissolved. There could be okay, debris also, small, small bits and pieces. Okay. But this will be the upper limit, but there could be debris coming out. Okay. Not, uh, it will not be like a single, single ions of cobalt. But it is a very interesting problem. So, uh, so many atoms of cobalt comes out per year and um, that based on the toxicity limits, it could cause uh, certain uh, um, cytotoxicity uh, or systemic toxicity uh, to the patient. Corrosion, that is a very big problem in metals. Um, corrosion and like um, polymers, metals face this because of oxidation. Uh, so, the oxides of metals are formed, hydroxides of metal form or sulphides of metal form. Okay. So, there could be chemical reaction, there could be electro electrochemical reaction with the environment, reaction because of oxygen, because of enzymes that are present in the body, oxidoreductase. So, they try to put in an oxygen into the metal. Uh, as you know, uh, our um, body fluids are very, very corrosive. You have uh, dissolved oxygen, we have enzymes, we have salts because it contains chloride salts. So, all these are very corrosive and uh, that uh, leads to corrosion, different types of corrosion we look at. Okay. So, rust, galvanic corrosion uh, is a common and occurs when two metals with different electrochemical charges are joined via a conductive path. So, if I have for example, even your uh, uh, prosthetic which contains cobalt, molybdenum, chromium. So, there could be galvanic type of because of electrochemical nature or if you have a certain biomaterial with two different metals, uh, one may act as an anode, uh, other may act as a cathode and there could be current and hence there could be corrosion. So, when we use dissimilar metals, in fact, we should avoid dissimilar metals um, and they were in contact, there could be current flow which will lead to this galvanic corrosion. So, the anode may start going down, um, dissolving into the solution. Stress corrosion, cracking, extreme tensile strength, especially when I am using uh, um, along the grain boundary, cracks could be forming okay? or if I am having screws uh, very tightly fitting, there could be stress corrosion. Okay? Microbial corrosion, because microbes we have sulphate reducing bacteria, we have oxidoreductase, all these can cause sulphate reducing bacteria activate in the absence of oxygen. Generally anaerobic, they produce hydrogen sulphide and cause sulphide stress cracking. In the presence of oxygen, aerobic bacteria will oxidize iron, to iron oxides and hydroxides. So, some bacteria oxidize sulphur to produce sulphuric acid which is again uh, an acid which can lead to sulphide corrosion. So, all these can happen. We can have uh, uh, anaerobic condition, um, hydrogen sulphide is formed, so sulphide stress cracking. In the aerobic condition, um, ox oxygen is there leading to oxides of iron, hydroxides. Um, sulphur sometimes is converted to sulphuric acid which leading to again uh, biogenic sulphide corrosion. So, all these are possible because of microbes. For example, if you take a nitinol, it is a very uh, popular material used in uh, cardiovascular stents uh, after an angioplasty. Um, it is made up of ni nickel and titanium equal amounts. It can exhibit severe pitting and crevice corrosion, but surface treatment to form amorphous oxide prevents the corrosion resistance. So, oxides 
can prevent corrosion resistance. Electrochemical polishing also increases corrosion resistance and uh, it reduces the nickel dissolution. Okay. So, otherwise nickel may be dissolving slowly into that. Uh, if you look at titanium aluminum NADM alloys, they are used in joints. They are very good corrosion resistance, but are subject to fretting and wear because uh, the aluminum can start wearing out. Cobalt, chromium, um, molybdenum, sorry this is a mistake here, molybdenum alloys are uh, also resistant to kind of corrosion okay, in body fluids, but cobalt is a big problem. It gets completely dissolved and the surface oxide changes into chromium oxide. So, cobalt uh, release is a problem. Okay. 316 L, it is cheap, it is very ubiquitous, it is used quite a lot in orthopedic, but then uh, it can go into corrosion, serious problem. Intergranular corrosion, because um, carbon is also present and so the heterogeneous carbon present can lead to corrosion, okay. pitting arising from the breakdown of the oxide layer. Okay. So, there could be pits formed as the oxide layer gets fretting. Nickel and man manganese are depleted in the oxide film and uh, the, the surface oxide composition changes mostly to chromium and iron with a small percentage of molybdenum in the human body. Okay. So, these start going out that is called fretting, crevice corrosion. So, when you have a bone plate and screws made up of 316 L at the interface, the screw heads and the counter sink holes, you can have this crevice corrosion. Galvanic corrosion, like I mentioned, if you have metals, dissimilar metals, combination of 316 L and cobalt, chromium, and molybdenum, or cobalt, chromium, titanium, aluminum, vanadium alloys, then you can have galvanic corrosion. So, um, 316 can have all sorts of corrosion. So, it is ideal uh, material for only short duration and not for very long uh, applications. Okay. So, you need to keep that in mind. Um, galvanic corrosion can also occur by using metal alloys that have undergone slightly different metal processing, cast versus rot. For example, if you take cobalt, chromium, molybdenum, uh, if you have a two of these, one made through casting, another th made through rot uh, method, then they can undergo galvanic corrosion. Okay. So, what are the methods? Barrier protection, we can have a surface layer, um, so that, that layer prevents the metal from contact with the atmosphere, air, water, greasing, painting, galvanizing, anodizing, oiling the surface, okay. coating a metal on another metal, electroplating. Okay. All these are barrier protection. Another is sacrificial protection, uh, that means you have another metal coating on top like zinc or magnesium, um, which gets oxidized. So, it prevents the main metal from getting corroded, that is called sacrificial protection. Okay, you sacrifice some other metal uh, which gets oxidized. Third is um, cathode protection. The metal object that is to be protected from rusting is connected to a piece of more electropositive metal like zinc. The anode is made up of more react element which loses electrons and get oxidized. So, the anode goes on disappearing and thus saves the cathode from rusting. Okay. So, zinc could be the anode the metal which you want to protect could be the cathode. So, zinc uh, will start uh, going into solution and disappear whereas, the other material remains okay. that is called the cathode protection. So, different ways of uh, barrier protections are possible. Okay. Um, so, when there is a um, corrosion ion becomes ion oxide. So, what could be the molecular weight change sorry what could be the volume change? Calculate the volume change when ion of this density is oxidized to iron of this density. So, molecular weight of iron is this. Okay. So, it is quite simple um, volume of iron is 55.85 divided by 7 point. So, this 7.1 cc per mole molecular weight of iron oxide is uh, 71.85 that means iron plus uh, oxygen okay. 55.8 plus uh, 16 that is 71. Volume of iron oxide is uh, 71.8 divided by 5.95, 12.08 cc. Okay. So, we have the volume of iron, we have the volume of iron oxide. So, look at this, there is a big change in the volume. Therefore, the percentage volume change is 104.9 divided by original sun, 70 percent change when iron gets iron oxide. So, when there is such a big change, what happens? These iron oxides becomes very 
unstable, very loose, it is like a flake, you know, it is very porous. So, it loses all the mechanical properties unlike the iron. So, that is a big problem. You understand this problem? So, iron density is 7.7, .7, uh, whereas iron oxide density is re reduction in density, obviously, that means there will be an increase in the volume, okay. That is about 70 percent increase in volume. So, how do you calculate? We, we use these density values, okay, and then we use the molecular weight value. So, molecular weight of iron is 54.85, molecular weight of iron oxide is this plus another 16, 71.85. So, we take the molecular weight divided by the density to get Cc uh, for both, then the volume change uh, 4.9. So, it has changed from 7.1 to 12.0. So, percentage is this difference divided by original into 100, 70 percent, that is a big change, okay. Now, let us look at electrical properties because electrochemical uh, corrosion is a very serious problem in um, uh, biomaterials when we are using different uh, types of metals joined together. Um, so, we will look at it. Metals are good conductors of electricity, okay. So, resistivity is the ratio of electric field to current density and uh, if you look at bone, resistivity is 46 ohms per meter, sorry ohms meter, muscle is 2, and gold is very, very low, ultra high molecular weight is very, very high when compared to these items actually. So, uh, the polymers have very high resistivity and um, metals like gold have very low res resistivity when compared to the various physiological um, body material, okay. Uh, so, electrochemical corrosion I said presence of dissolved oxygen, proteins, water, ions such as chlorides and hydroxide in the body fluid. And if two dissimilar metals are present, the one that is most negative in the galvanic series will become anode, and the other one becomes cathode. What is this galvanic series? We will look at it. This corrosion is much more rapid than the normal. Um, so, this happens biomaterials with dissimilar metals, mixed metals or even in homogeneity in the same material. So, if you have alloys, cobalt, chromium and so on, in homogeneity, so one could be acting as anode, other could be acting as cathode and there could be um, current flow and there could be galvanic corrosion. So, what is this most negative in the galvanic series? Let us look at the galvanic series electrochemical data. Lithium going to lithium plus minus 3.05 ohms, sodium going to sodium plus minus 2.7, aluminum going to aluminum 3 plus minus 1.6, titanium going to titanium 3 plus minus 1.63, iron going to iron 3 plus minus 4 point, hydrogen going to 2 H plus 0, silver going to silver plus 0.799, gold going to go gold plus 1.1, 1 1.68. .1, so, most negative in the series will be the anode and the other one will be cathode. So, there will be corrosion that is taking place and that particular material will be dissolving, okay. So, if I have here uh, yeah, iron and gold uh, most negative, so this will become anode, okay. So, uh, Fe 2 electrons can become Fe 2 plus, so this can go into solution, okay. That is why these gold, silver, even platinum can resist corrosion. That is why when you go into um, biosensors, lead wires, they always use the noble metals, okay. So, uh, look at this. So, most negative will be the anode. So, if I am having a aluminum and iron, this will become the anode and this will become the cathode, okay. More, if I am having iron and gold, this will become the anode, this will become the cathode. And uh, this is the reaction for iron, iron plus 2 electron, um, so you get Fe2 plus. So, this starts going into solution. So, uh, the electrochemical corrosion, um, galvanic corrosion is much more serious problem and um, one needs to keep in mind when designing biomaterial, having dissimilar materials uh, in contact with each other. So, you may have to have a ceramic or you may have to have uh, uh, insulator or a polymer in between, so that the galvanic current is broken down, okay. Uh, of course, you can also have a micro corrosion because the grain boundaries act as anode and the interior part acts as the cathode, okay. So, there could be a current flowing and the grain boundaries get disturbed. Sometimes cracks in metals can act as an anode and metal remaining metal can be a cathode, okay, because the cracks may have less amount of oxygen. So, there is a uh, difference in homogeneity in the amount of oxygen present. 
So that is called the micro corrosion, okay. that also could be a serious uh, problem. So metals have this uh, particular issue uh, of uh, normal corrosion because of presence of oxygen, because of presence of aerobic bacteria which oxidizes. Uh, sulfate, sulfur reducing bacteria in the anaerobic condition forms hydrogen sulfide, sulfide cracking or even formation of uh, um, sulfuric acid. So then the dissimilar metal type of uh, corrosion. Um, so uh, one is looking at a, using a passivating layer, uh, looking at sacrificing sacrificial um, materials and so on actually. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your time.